So let's now look at the complexity. What is it that this Viterbi algorithm, why is it useful? Uh, because we have taken what would otherwise be a brute force search, all of the possible paths, and instead we have created a, um, a sequence of operations that organizes and does it in an orderly and efficient manner. First of all, what operations are we talking about? Well, they're extremely simple operations. In fact, there are three operations. Add, compare, select. Add, take the previous path metric, add to it the branch metric. I did my addition. I always have two for each one of the states. I compare the two. I compare the two. And the one that's the biggest, I get rid of it. <laughs> the one that's the smallest, I select it. And then I know to move on. Add, compare, select. So these are the operations that you require in your hardware. Very, very simple. Memory. So this comes to the traceback length, uh, the maximum length of a path, or the traceback length. And that, like I said, is an engineering choice. And uh, it uh, forces me to create a merge, maybe when there isn't, to force a convergence when there isn't. And there are some good figures of merit for what would be a reasonable length, a good compromise between complexity, the size of the memory, and the performance, and it's something like four or five times the constraint length of the code. So the longer the constraint length, the more powerful the code, because you can imagine you have more redundancy, uh, more interconnectivity that gives you more um, structure to your redundancy, uh, but of course it also increases the complexity, the complexity of the encoder because you have more registers, minor increase in complexity, but a big increase in memory also in the um, decoder. So, memory can be characterized by this traceback length, this maximum length of a path that you're going to keep track of. And then you have to ask yourself, what are the uh, elements that are being kept in memory? And part of them is the uh, actual state. You know, I need a, beat sequ a bit sequence for each path. So there are 2 to the k minus 1 is the number of states. Okay, and for each one of the states, I have to keep a bit sequence. So each one of the states, I have the path leading to that state. And so h is the length of that path. And so this is the number of memory cells I need that just keeps the paths. Now, in addition to the paths themselves, for each one of the states, I also need to keep the path metric. So maybe this is binary memory, and this is I'm going to have to have several bits, you know, allow, allow me to accumulate the, the path metric. So, operations, what are the complexity for the Viterbi algorithm, and memory, how much memory do I need uh, to keep? One way to quantify the quality of a code, so suppose I have offered to me a selection of codes. Which code should I use? Or when I'm designing a code, um, how do I know if I've gotten the best code that I can for a given level of complexity and redundancy? Uh, or if there were a better set of vectors? So the way that we can evaluate code is to talk about the distance between code words. This is a, an important concept that helps us understand why error correcting codes work. I like to talk about um, original message space. A message originally had k bits, and we move it to n bits. If we look at the possibility of all messages, it's the size of 2 to the k. But if we look at the message, the space of all code words, there are 2 to the n. Of course, 2 to the n is much bigger than 2 to the k because we choose, you know, we've added redundancy. So think of this as a space, some sort of space, and this is the dimension of the space. So I started out with a space where it was big enough to have uh, 2 to the k messages. And that's all the space there was. There was space in this set for 2 to the k messages. Now I've expanded it, and I have a much bigger space. And in this bigger space, I still only have 2 to the k messages, because the other ones are not valid code words. There are valid 2 to the k code words. 
So this big space has space for two to the n words, but there are only two to the k of them, which actually represent valid code words. These things are now, they've got emptiness around them. And the emptiness around them is kind of what makes it more robust. It's easy for me to tell which one of these code words is right than it is to tell me which one of these messages are right. Because these messages are fairly close, but these code words are far apart. So if you think of it in an abstract way like that, you can think about these code words being placed in space. And how far apart these code words are tells me how good these code words are. A, a good code is going to have code words that are far apart from one another. A really bad code is going to have like two code words right next to each other. That would be like useless because the whole point of creating this big space was to be able to spread things out. All of this is motivation for the quantification of the quality of an error correcting code. And the quality of an error correcting code is determined by the distance between code words. So there's this big space, how far apart are they? In different codes, they'll have different minimum separation between code words. So I said at the beginning that there were two kinds of codes. There were block codes, convolutional codes. Block codes are a little more straightforward. This whole thing I said about two of the n-dimensional space, it's like, really is that? <laughs> but now when I'm talking about convolutional codes, it's really sequences that are a code word, right? Block codes, you know, K becomes N, it's a set of code words, that's it. Convolutional codes is really a little more complicated than that because there are sequences. Um, but, really, I can also defi define a distance between sequences. I've already done it, these path metrics, you know? So I know how to define um, a distance between code words in a convolutional code. And they are going to tell me whether I have a, a good code, a great code, a lousy code. So, what we want to do is, among all of the typical, uh, all the available valid code words, look at all of the pairs and find out which ones are at the minimal distance. And the ones at the minimal distance, the middle distance, it determines the, the strength of the code, just like it is with a constellation. Same, same goes for the code. Except now, these code words are going to be sequences. So, they're going to be paths. So I have to look at any two paths through the chalice and look at the two paths which are the closest and they will determine the minimum distance for my code. So there's a trick when I'm trying to find this minimum distance. So we can think of it as uh, two candidate pairs. So I have a sequence which is uh, bit 1, bit 2, bit n. Here's some sequence through the trellis. And then I have another one, some other sequence through the trellis, some other path through the trellis. And I'm saying, what is the distance between these two? And I want to do this for all of the paths that are possible through the trellis, all of the pairs. Calculate the distance between them, having distance for hard decisions. But there's a little trick, and that is because I realize that this is a linear code. And linear codes, all I have to do is compare the distance between any one of these code words and zero. And the, when I find the minimal distance between this one and zero, it's the same as if I had checked them all against one another. Okay, so it's just a trick. So if I want to find the minimum distance, what I do is I check all of the paths, and I say, how far is this path from this code? And that tells me the distance, and I try all the bonds, and the one is the smallest. Well, I know if I checked all of the pairs, I'd get the same thing. So now that we've seen the concept of the minimum distance for a code, let's go through the mechanics. How do I find the minimum distance for a code? So, the procedure is quite simple. I start at state A, and I finish at state A. Why do I start at state A and finish at state A? Because my whole point was I was going to compare it to a path that was all zeros. And the path of all zeros is state A, state A, state A, state A, state A. So it starts at A and it ends at A, for sure. So now I look at all the paths that could start at A, end at A, and they can do anything in between. So I check all of those, and I look for the smallest distance. And when I find that, all the possible paths start at A, end at A, whichever one is the shortest distance, that's the minimum distance. We call that, for convolutional codes, instead of calling it the minimum distance, we call it the free distance. And the free distance of a code determines the performance of that code. In fact, 
the minimum distance, this free distance, actually tells us what is the code's ability to correct an erroneous path. And that is, I take the free distance, minus 1, divide by 2, take the greatest integer, and that is the maximum number of bits I can correct. And of course, the larger this number is, the more errors along the path that I can fix. Remember I said that the, the path length was the number of errors? So how many errors can I correct? Up to a certain amount. After that, my redundancy is not sufficient. I'm not going to be able to correct it. So clearly, I want to have the free distance as large as possible. I want to correct as many errors as possible. So let's start with our example and start looking at um, distances for different paths. So the first way is I, I just have to start at A and end at A. And so I just start looking through the path. Well, I can start at A and go down to B. I'm at B. I eventually want to get back up to A, so I'm not going to go down to D. I'm going to say I go back to C. Oh, from C, I have a path that lets me up to A. So there's one path, and I just chose it just like that. Uh, I start at A, I end at A. And I look now at the difference in the decoder, supposing that you know the true uh, code word was the 00, zero because state A to state A is always zero code word. I look at the code word for transition A to B, and I say, how different is it from the code word 00? Zero, zero? And the code word for the transition A to B is 11, one, so the distance is 2. So now I look at the transition from B to C, the code word, and I take the code word, the difference between that and the code word for A to A, uh, which is 00, zero, and there's one bit, and here there's 2. So now I add these up. 2 plus 1 plus 2, and I see that that um, path has a path length of 5. Okay, so that's 1. Now, now I've got I to do all the paths that start at A and end at A. So I went to B and I went to C. Now suppose instead of going to C, I went to D. Well, I got to D and I said, I'm trying to get up to A. So I'm going to go to C and then I'm going to go to A. So now I have the path and I can calculate that metric. Okay, let's look at another path. Suppose that I stayed at D instead of going to C, and now I see that this is 7. So I had a 5, a 6, and a 7. It's getting bigger. So now I get, like, I know that if I start adding segments here, it's just going to get bigger because I'm sort of doing all of the variations on how to get back up to A. So I go through that exercise. Here's one I just want to point out where this path seems longer in time, but it's only like, like 6. So you really have to investigate all of them, depending on the code, to see uh, which one has the shortest length. But you go through the exercise up and down, calculating each time what is the distance. And finally, when you do that, you find the one that was the smallest, and that determines the efficiency of your code. And in this case, the free distance is equal to 5 for the code that we've been using in our example. If we go back now, if I say that the free distance is equal to 5, that means that, um, that I have 5 minus 1 divided by 2, 4 divided by 2 is 2, greatest integer in 2 is 2. So this code can correct um, errors up to 2 errors in the uh, code, in the path. Excuse me.